Good morning. Good morning. And happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. It's always a, nice to have a little uh, remembrance of, of us and of what we try to do. So happy Father's Day to all of you. I want to highlight a few of the ministry opportunities. First of all, a couple of things that are happening today. One, today is the deadline for turning in um, the uh, baby bottle of blessing, the bottle or an envelope or, or last chance to put some donation into uh, the uh, bottle that's out there. And so uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, if you haven't already done that, uh, we, we'll still take them. If, you, for, if you're like, ah, forgot to bring it, you, we'll, we'll still take them. They'll, they'll still take out any donation. Uh, but today was kind of the day where we're stopping that campaign. Related to that, I know we're not doing the joys and concerns yet, but um, given what's been happening over the last couple weeks, pray for Morningstar. Uh, they are one of those that could be targeted. They haven't been, but uh, some of the protests and some of the violent protests and some of the um, vandalism and things that are happening to pregnancy centers. Uh, so praise, please pray for Morningstar. Uh, there's another one locally, I think it's Capital Area. Pregnancy services. Uh, so we'll let, let's be in prayer, especially for their safety, as they seek to do uh, that which God has called them to do. So, so keep that in mind. So today is the deadline for that. Also, immediately following uh, this time of worship, uh, for all members of the church, uh, we're having a special meeting uh, to approve, ratify, whatever the word is, uh, the uh, amendments, the additions, the corrections. Uh, to our Constitution. Uh, so uh, I encourage all of you to, to stay, uh, those of you who are members, to stay for, for that time. We'll take a little break um, in between worship and that meeting, but uh, we'll hold that pretty, pretty much after the uh, meeting today. After worship today. Um, so as we said, today is Father's Day, a day for us to remember, uh, to reflect, to give thanks, and uh, so in order to help us do that, uh, we have a, a short video, uh, Father's Day Tribute.
Lord, we thank you that they were a symbol of you. Although they were frail in their attempt to do that which you wanted to do, wanted them to always do, yet they pointed to you, pointed to our Heavenly Father, who indeed is perfect and loving and holy and righteous. So God, we thank you that we can gather together today to, to thank our fathers, but more importantly and most importantly to thank you for being our Heavenly Father. God, it is good for us to worship you, to praise you, to lift your name high above every name, to proclaim that you are a good God. We thank you that your love was so strong for us that even though we sinned against you, even though we went our own way, even then, though we rebelled against you, yet you loved us so much that you would send your one and only Son to become our Savior to be that sacrifice in our place, to be the one who would redeem us from our iniquity and sin. So God, we thank you for Jesus the Christ and his willingness out of his love and his obedience to you to die on the cross on our behalf. We also thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives in us and indwells us empowering us to do that which you have commanded us to do, which is first and foremost to love you, and secondly to love our neighbor as ourselves. But God, we know we do not always follow this command. So God, in this moment, we want to examine our own lives, examine our own behavior, our own actions, our own words, our own thoughts, and confess our sins.
church. Some of you may have known this, for some reason this date, holiday, always sticks in my mind. I don't know why, but this past Tuesday, June 14th, was National Flag Day. I don't know if you knew that, uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure why that piece of trivia really sticks in. Um, I'm not even sure if like, post offices are closed, I'm not sure how, how all that happened. But June 14th, Flag Day, because it commemorates that same date in 1777, when the first Continental Congress approved the design for the first national flag. And of course, as you know from tradition, and if you've been to Philadelphia, of course, you know that Betsy Ross, at least tradition for this debate, I know, but we in Philadelphia believe strongly that Betsy Ross indeed stitched that first flag that was approved by the Continental What's interesting, though, that it was not until 1916, under President Woodrow Wilson, that we had the first proclamation of the national flag day. But then it wasn't until 1949, more historical trivia, I know, just in case you're on Jeopardy someday. In 1949, under President Harry Truman, was when it really became a holiday as he signed into law that June 14th would be National Flag Day holiday. Flags have been around forever. It, it, it might, it, a little aside here, if I could have found an appropriate clip, I, I, would, have, I would have played uh, from Big Bang Theory. Some of you maybe watched that, and Sheldon, you know, he, he liked fun with flags. <laughs> it was not an appropriate clip that I could show here again. But anyway, uh, but, but flags, you know, and as he would tell us, flags have been around forever, and in fact they have been, or at least some form of flags and banners and that type of thing have been around all the way back to antiquity. Early on, they were typically used in battle, in warfare. It's kind of a, a rallying point, something you would hold up to, to show that we're in such and such an army. And some of the early ones, however, were not made of fabric. They were rather made of metal or wood. Sometimes they were just large poles that had some kind of emblem on top, and they were called vexifloids. I know you wanted to know that. Uh, here's a sample of one of them. This is actually a, an ancient uh, Arcadian flag made out of bronze, actually. And so someone would carry this, and that would have been a longer uh, shaft there, a longer pole, and they would have carried this into battle. And the soldier would rally around. This is this is our army. This is our flag. Now, of course, later on, uh, they stopped using bronze metal because they they wanted something that was even a bigger rallying point. And you, as you can imagine, a, a fabric flag, you know, being drawn by a horse, you know, uh, someone on horseback, and flying in the wind. That was a rallying point. And we've still seen movies of that especially if you think back to the Revolutionary War or, or other wars where you have that horse going, you know, and the flags waving, and it kind of rallied this troops behind that, that uh, flag and, and around that symbol. And of course, the symbol was for that country or, or that people that was going to go out and do the fighting. And of course, over time, then these flags and banners and things uh, each nation then came up with theirs, and you can, you know, look those up, the, the uh, flags of the various nations, and they're, they're there in New York City outside the UN, and, and all of that, and the, the flags became kind of a national symbol for that particular country. And, and I, in my reading on flags this past week, I came across this paragraph that I thought really did a good job of talking about national flags and their importance and their meanings. And it, it, it was this. The national flag is the depiction of a country's social, economic, and political values. A national flag of a country is a national honor. 
It carries the values on which the mere foundation of the nation depends. It is the roof under which the feeling of nationalism and patriotism flourishes. It represents the hopes, the aspirations for the citizen of its country, and a symbol of national pride. It is not just a piece of cloth, but a feeling of pride which helps the soldiers to sacrifice their lives just to keep it flying high in the sky. The national flag, a symbol of that who we are. And so, so we have this flag here, a symbol of the United States, uh, one that we, we wave proudly as it proclaims the value of our nation and that which we take pride in. The name of God that we're going to look at this morning connects itself to this idea of a flag or a banner. And the name of God that we're looking at today is Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. Or another way to say it, the Lord is my flag. That word Nisi, which means my banner, um, comes from the Hebrew word Nase, which really has to do with anything that is kind of high and lifted up and used as a rallying point. And in the Old Testament, in various translations, it's translated different ways. It can be translated as flag, it can be translated as banner, it can be translated as a sign, even in one place it's just translated as a pole that was lifted high. But anything that kind of rallies people around, anything that is kind of a focal point that is lifted high is a banner or a flag. And what this name says to us about God is that God, the one who is high and lifted up, as we sang in one of the songs earlier, God who is high and lifted up, he is our banner. He is our flag. He is the one that we rally around. He is the one in whom we are proud of. He is the one who, in fact, informs our character, informs our values. He is the head of the nation, the kingdom to which we are citizens. He is not a representation of that, like a flag is a symbol, but rather he is the one. He himself is the one who is high and lifted up. He is our banner. And as we live and as we do ministry, we do everything under him as our banner. You know, ships, they, they sail under the flag of a certain country. People uh, fight under the banner or flag of a certain country. We have our being and we live and move and do ministry under the banner who is God. We have a banner here, a flag here, but that is not our banner. It represents and it points to Yahweh Nisi, who is our banner, who is our flag, who is the one that we live under and inform us how to live as citizens of the kingdom of God. Yahweh Nisi. Now, this comes from a story in the book of Exodus. And so I invite you to turn with me, and I'll say it right this, this week. Exodus 17. Exodus 17, verses 8 to 15. And it is in this story that we find this name of God, Yahweh Nisi. Yahweh, for the Lord, is my banner. Begin in verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur 
held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner. He said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. By the time of this story, the people of Israel, the Israelites, had been in the wilderness for about two months. They, last week we saw that they were up in Mara, and just prior to that, they had crossed the Red Sea. But now as they traveled down this side of the peninsula, it's been about two months when they arrived in the area of Nephidim. And during that time, they learned that God provided in a variety of ways. He provided direction. He provided food. He also provided water. In this story, what they learn is that God will now provide victory over a hostile neighbor and a hostile foe. And that foe are the Amalekites. The Amalekites were a nomadic people. They kind of traveled throughout that uh, peninsula and even onto this side over here. And they traveled around, but they were a very fierce, powerful, and warlike <coughs> people, willing to fight anyone who got in their way. What's also interesting, though, about the Amalekites is that they were cousins of the Hebrew people. You see, the Amalekites were descendants of Esau, who was Jacob's brother. So they were family. But by this time, that didn't matter. And what we learn from Deuteronomy 25 is that as the Hebrew people were making their way south, what the Amalekites would do is they would kind of pick off slowly the stragglers, those who were kind of you know, walking behind, those that were uh, a little weaker, those that couldn't keep up with the rest of the group. You know, so some of you, it, similar to uh, what a lion does, some of you watch nature shows, you know, and, and you've seen the, uh, the, that herd of antelope out there, oh, how beautiful, and they're jumping and jumping. And then the camera, though, goes to, over this way, to this lion. And that lion is there, you know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. That lion is there, and, and then the camera points to this, oh, this little antelope, who's not keeping up with mommy. And you know that that's where the lion is going to go. Going to go to the weaker one. And you're yelling at the TV, run away, run away. And then you're like, why doesn't the cameraman do something? <laughs> He's right there. Well, that's what the Amalekites were doing. Here, here's this large band of Hebrew people. But they start knocking off the, the, the weaker ones, the, the ones that are you know, dragging behind. The ones who aren't keeping up. Well, that eventually turns into a full-fledged fight, a full-fledged battle. And so it's the Amalekites against the Hebrew people. But it was a battle that was fought like no other battle. You know, I've never seen a battle uh, or heard about a battle or seen on TV a battle where the president of some country goes up to some hill, lifts up a staff, and say, fight! But that's what happened. There they are, the Amalekites and the Hebrew people down in this valley, and Moses and Aaron and Hur, they're up on this mountain, and Moses raises up a staff, the staff of God, the rod of God. And as long as he had his arm up, the people of Israel were winning the battle. But you can't, it's hard to do that all day, isn't it? It's hard to do that for five minutes. I'm getting tired already. <laughs> And, and, but as that arm started to go down, the Amalekites started winning. And even that staff became a nace, became one of those things high lifted up a rallying point, because you can just imagine, as the soldiers are fighting, they're looking up at the mountain, and, and they see the, the staff high and lifted up, and that gives them 
motivation to keep fighting. And then, but then, you know, you know, they start seeing that go down, and then they see their fellow soldiers starting to fall, and morale starts going down. So Aaron and her, they, they help Moses hold them up so that they can win the battle. But as the soldiers are watching this, and as they reflect on that, it becomes very clear who won that battle for them, how that battle was won. That it was not their own strength, it was not their own efforts, but rather it was because God was with them. You see, that, that, that rod that was not some magic wand, you know, Moses go, oh, you know, they start winning. But rather that rod, that staff, indeed was a staff of God, and it was a symbol, it was a banner, it was a rallying point, it was like a flag proclaiming that God is here. And that God is personally and powerfully involved in this battle. God is the one who wins the battle. One commentator wrote about it this way. The battle was not won by military might or superior battle plan. It was won by the power of God. The hands and the rods of Moses were held up in the same way that the soldiers hold up their flags in the time of battle. As these flags bear the insignia of their country, the soldiers are said to fight under that banner. The Israelites fought under the direction of God, Yahweh Nisi. It was under the Lord's banner, and with His aid they fought. And in His name and strength they conquered. They learned that day as Moses then built an altar in worship and praise to God, and called that altar and the name of God Yahweh Nisi, that God is the one who won the battle. It was God in His strength and His power that battles are won. And that would be what God would do throughout the wilderness. And as the people of Israel enter the promised land, God would be the one who would win the battles, even before they were fought. As we think of Yahweh Nisi, as we think of the name of God, that He is our banner, and we think about this story, it is a story that is so relevant to us as Christ followers because we too encounter many battles in life. We in fact are in the midst of a war, a spiritual warfare, and we need someone to help us. And the fact that we have this name, Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner, in fact tells us that when we go into battle, when we are in the midst of the war, God is there with us. And we will be victorious if we trust in God, if we depend on God, if we indeed honor His name and allow Him to take control of the situation and take control of what's going on. The writer of the book of Proverbs said it this way in Proverbs 21, 30 to 31, there is no wisdom no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. We can do all the preparation we want, and we should, but we need to put our trust in the Lord because the victory is His. The power to win is His. We need to honor His name and live and walk under His back, under Him. It's interesting that the uh, Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so, uh, before Christ was born, 70 rabbis uh, got together and they translated the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek so that the Greek-speaking Jews could read and understand the Old Testament. What's interesting, when they got to this passage, is that they took some liberty. Instead of translating into the Greek the phrase, the Lord is my banner, they instead loosely translated it 
in terms of the meaning of what it was saying, into the Lord is my refuge. Now, yeah, that's not a direct translation. But it does get at the heart and the meaning of what Moses was saying in God's name. He is our banner. He is our refuge, especially in times of battle. So I want to take a few moments to look at four of the battles that we have. And look at how God is indeed our refuge, how he is our battle, how he is going to help us in these battles. The first battle is the battle of our own sinful nature. Paul, in Romans chapter 7, talks about this battle. And he described it this way in his own life. Romans 7, 21 to 25, he wrote, So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul describing a daily situation for him, and a daily situation for us as well. He said he loves the law of God. Uh, he said that he loves the law of God. He loves to do God's will. And he sets out to do God's will, but as he does, suddenly, there's this other law working inside of him, that's the sin nature, and he ends up not doing what he wants to do, which is God's will. You see, when we become Christ followers, we receive a new nature. We are recreated, we are transformed. The problem is, is that until Christ comes again, we still have that old nature in us. And the two natures battle. We want to do God's will. But the old nature says, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. And we say, yes, we do. And they said, no, you don't. And so there's this battle. And Paul then asks the question, who's going to rescue me from this? And the answer comes back, Yahweh Nisi, the Lord Jesus Christ who is our man. Jesus the Christ is the one who rescues us from this dilemma. It is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we have the new nature to begin with. And it is also Jesus the Christ who has also given to us the Holy Spirit. So it is Jesus the Christ who on the cross won victory over sin. And what we need to do is yield to the Holy Spirit and to do what he tells us to do. What do we do? When we cave in to that old nature, when we cave in to what we want to do, we still have a rescue. And that rescue is in the forgiveness that Jesus gives us through the cross. And so we see a battle. A battle with our sin nature. Our old nature and our new nature battling together. And we have seen the victory. We have seen when we have been able to resist by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have also seen when we have fallen short. But when in forgiveness we have gone before God, we have received forgiveness. The Holy Spirit then has set us back on the right track. And we have received that victory. A battle for sure. One that through the Holy Spirit. Second battle is a battle with the world. A battle with the world. So there's a battle with our own sinful nature inside of us. There's also a battle with the world. John wrote this in his first letter. In chapter 2, 15 to 17, he said, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has, has and does, comes not from the Father, 
are from the world. The world and the desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. He says, do not love the world. Now, that doesn't mean you can't like your car, <laughs> that you can't like the microwave, <laughs> or that refrigerator that keeps things nice and cool. He's talking about loving the world and loving the things in the world that distract us and take us away from God. So that could be your TV. As much as you love your TV, that smart TV, which sometimes is smarter than me. <laughs> but if it takes us away from God, he says, the things that we enjoy and look, if we think of, if we love things in the world more than we love God, if we love things in the world and it takes us away from loving others. And so the world has a lot of good things to offer, but it has a lot of things that it offers that takes us away from God and from doing what God calls us to do and what God calls us to be. And that's what John's talking about. He's saying, don't love the world and those things. But that's a struggle, isn't it? It's a struggle fight, a battle, because the world has offers some pretty good things that in our flesh we say, that's pretty nice, but it can take us away from what we really need to be focusing on in terms of God. Later on in the letter, John, John says this, you dear children, you are from God and have overcome them. The them are those individuals, those people, those things that in the world that would distract us from God. He said, but you have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. Yes. The world throws a lot of temptations at us. But the Holy Spirit that is in us is greater than any commercial, any advertisement, any enticement of the world. And we just need to rely and go to Him because greater is the Holy Spirit that is in us than He that is in the world. Then there's the battle with the devil. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 13, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Paul makes it very clear that perhaps of all these three that we have on the screen, one of the most powerful is in fact the devil himself. He says that much of our fight is not against the, the things that we see around us, the world, and even our sinful nature, but the greatest power is in fact the devil himself who battles against us, fights against us. We know that James says that the devil is like a lion. And we already talked about that lion. You know that lion that's prowling around looking for that little lion in the hole. That's the lion. He's roaring around looking to see who he will devour. And we have two examples in Scripture. One was Job. The devil wanted to devour Job. But God protected him, right? In the New Testament, Jesus says to Peter, Hey, the devil has asked my father to sift you like wheat. And what does Jesus say? He says, I pray on your behalf. And that's not the The devil wants us, but God has given us tools. He's given us the full armor of God. And 
I encourage you later on this afternoon, at the end of your Father's Day now, um, to, to read the rest of Ephesians chapter 6 there and read the full armor of God. But well, what's interesting at the end of his description of the full armor of God, he then says this important thing, and above all, pray. Because that's where the power is. You know, you can put on all the armor you want, but if you don't ask God to help you use it in prayer, it's not going to help. So he says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the things that the devil's going to throw at you. And pray that God helps you use them. And then we have the last one, which is the battle in persecution. The battle in persecution. We see that all around us. Did you ever walk into a room of people you didn't know that well and they found out you were a follower of Christ? And did you see some of their looks? Where you begin to tell people about your beliefs and your values. We're living in some difficult times right now. And when we tell people we agree with some of the things that are, might be coming down, some changes in the law, we say we disagree with this monthly emphasis in June of pride. We get mocking, we get ridiculed, we get hate speech. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? We who are often called and claimed to be using hate speech, it's now coming back on us. Where we live out the gospel that says, tell others about Jesus Christ. And people make fun of us and mock us and push us away and say, I want nothing to do with you. Persecution. But Paul talks about our lives even in the midst of persecution when he wrote in Romans 8. And we know that in all things God works for good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He then went on to say, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger with a sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors. We are more than overcomers. Through God who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. We are in the middle of a war, a spiritual war. And along the way we may lose some battles. Because we believe in Yahweh Nisi, the Lord who is our banner, we will not lose the war. And we will see the final victory when Christ comes again to take us home to the kingdom waiting for us in heaven. Oh, what a day that is. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you. For reminding us and telling us that you are Yahweh Nisi, that you are our banner. You are the one who is our refuge. You are the one that has called us into your kingdom. And God, we thank you that you are with us. And that you have helped us to win the battle. God, continue to watch over us, to protect us, to guide us and guard us. 